I think once they talk into a microphone up there, it'll, I hope so. it'll be better. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our combined Sunday school class this morning. Let's get things started with singing with hymn number eight. Hymn number eight. I love thy kingdom, Lord. For joining us on Zoom this morning, please be sure to mute your microphone. Beautiful to see who I always see anybody with. And all of you on Zoom, be sure to mute your microphone so we don't hear you talking. Um, but we're glad to have everyone with us on this beautiful Sunday. Um, this morning, by happenstance, I picked short hymns. I don't, um, there was no rhyme or reason to the fact that they all came out short. They were picked from scripture and things, but it just turned out. So we're going to sing a few extra verses this morning, just if you will. Please turn with me to hymn number 43. It's probably the most recognizable in all of the English-speaking words, partly for the message it offered. Uh, Amazing Grace, hymn number 43, and we'll sing all four verses. Like they've moved the podium over to the right. I know it. Like maybe she's gonna call where that little stand is there. Well, there's a microphone. And that's re and with the screen back there, maybe that's why they've got it focused on it. Looks like they can move it though. Seem like that's terribly interesting in the grand scheme of things, but it is. If you 
take it one step farther, they are kind of like the future of our church. And I think it is so wonderful that these kids have grown kids, these young people. You know who that is. No. Through, through their lives here in the church and still part of the youth group. And some will continue to be a part of the youth group even after graduating. So if you're at the church this morning, take a moment when they do recognize them because they're amazing. I quit saying kids, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have people joining us on the live stream this morning, uh, and in fact, for the next several weeks, they will be doing that. Um, for those of you, if, if you find yourself on a Sunday night able to be here, you're welcome to join us. I think the link will be available either in email or on, the, on our church website. On the other side. Our prayer hymn this morning is hymn number 196. Number 196, O oh God, our help in ages past. And we'll do verses one, four, and five. Mm -hmm. One, four, and five. <clears throat>
Herman, Judge Herman Phoenix. Now, I don't I don't see him here today, but uh, maybe he's still celebrating. Uh, as far as announcements go, uh, don't forget that John Alexander is uh, presenting an organ recital this afternoon at five o'clock in the sanctuary. So I know a lot of folks uh, stick around after the uh, proceedings in the sanctuary for him to do a concert each afternoon, each uh, Sunday after this service. And so this this evening this or afternoon, you will be able to hear him and all of his uh, great talent. Now, for a little bit of humor, very little. Uh, in an obscure monastery in the high Himalayas, the monks are allowed to break their vow of silence, but they're only limited to two words every 10 years. So they had a new recruit that came in, and uh, he had been there for uh, 10 years before he was allowed to speak. So when he got to speak to the chief honcho of the monks, he only had two words to say. So he said, boo, bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, he waited another 10 years and got before the uh, chief of the monks and uh, whatever his title might be. And he was allowed two more words. He said, bad, hard. And uh, that didn't go over too well. So he waited another decade and uh, had his chance again to speak two words. He said, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the chief monk said, I'm not surprised you've been complaining ever since you came here. <laughs> uh, Al Longer is going to introduce our speaker today. Well, it's been a long time since I talked to Sasha Sutroff. Got it? Good. <laughs> uh, as many of you know from the preliminary staff, uh, he is from Russia, a Russian citizen today. He's a guest here in the United States. Um, he served the KGB for 16 years, I believe, as captain. And, uh, Started the seminary, Moscow Seminary, in 1993. I don't know how many some of your talk. I don't mean to be doing that. Um, we have not talked about what he's going to talk about. So um, we are really excited to have him here. He's the guest uh, of this class in our church. He's been to other churches around Greensboro. We've read before. And, uh, Sasha, we just welcome you. And anybody who is on Zoom. Amen.
through local knowledge in place, say you need to know your location to be able to communicate properly, right? Okay, now don't you think though that it was I who invented this whole concept of the importance of the local knowledge because Jesus Christ, the Lord Himself, in fact, practiced just that approach while on earth in flesh. I mean, take a look at this map if you would. This is the map of the Palestine of the time of Jesus. And you see uh, the Jordan River parting one side from the other side. Well, we all know that uh, Jesus was born in a little town of Bethlehem. And uh, then he was brought to uh, Jerusalem uh, to be uh, presented at uh, the temple. And then uh, it uh, became unsafe for uh, the family to remain in the area, so they fled to Egypt that way. And then they came back and uh, uh, resided in the town of Nazareth. Now, when the Jesus grew up to the age of about uh, 30, he made a trip to the Jordan River, where he was baptized by John. And uh, from there, Jesus went into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. From there, Jesus go, goes back to um, uh, his town of uh, Nazareth and uh, makes a couple of uh, trips to Nine and to Sychar, uh, performs all kinds of uh, miracles out there, and then moves on to the town of Capernaum. Now, in the town of Capernaum, Jesus called his first disciples, and uh, together with the disciples, Jesus was traveling all over the area of Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Now, eventually, they made it back to the shore, and that day, when evening came, Jesus uh, said to uh, his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Let us go over to the other side. Now, we all know that uh, the Bible is the word of God, right? Right? right. right. Good, good start. <laughs> so whatever is in the Bible has got to have some utmost importance to it, correct? correct? Okay, now you tell me then what's the utmost importance of this little phrase, let us go over to the other side, is since the phrase made its way to the Bible. Can you tell? Well, just by looking at the map, you can tell that Jesus, by the age of 30, had not been to the other side ever as of yet. Which is already a big deal. I mean, think of it. It is a totally unknown and new territory for Jesus. Right? Okay, now you take a look at the Bible and you realize that uh, there were, in fact, way, way more differences between this side and the other side than just that. I mean, take the matter of healing the sick, for example. On Jesus' side, the sick whom Jesus healed were sick, but um, they were sort of a kind of a peacefully sick. Well, th there was this man with a wooden hand, and uh, there was a leper whom Jesus cleansed, and uh, there was uh, Simon's mother who had a fever, and they were sick, but they were not like demon possessed or anything. Now, Jesus goes over. To the other side. Uh, and when Jesus had come out of the boat, says the Bible, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who lived in the tombs. And no one could bite him anymore, not even with the chain. For he had often been bound with feathers and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the feathers he broke and killed. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. 
Now, wouldn't you say he was kind of different <laughs> on the other side? Well, take the matter of uh, Jesus' popularity, for example. On Jesus' side, his popularity was growing at all times. I mean, remember, at first, they couldn't find a room big enough in a house to hold all the followers of Jesus who wanted to see Jesus performing miracles on the sick. They had to take the roof of the house out to bring yet another rather peaceful paralytic in. Well, eventually, the crowd of Jesus' followers grew so big that Jesus uh, couldn't find a square big enough on the city uh, to hold all the followers of Jesus who wanted to hear him preach. So Jesus had to move away from the town to preach in the fields. But eventually, the crowd of followers of Jesus grew so big that the Jesus had to get onto a boat so that uh, the crowd would not crush him. Now, Jesus goes over to the other side and uh, casts out a legion of demons from that man into a herd of swine. And uh, he sends the herd into uh, the Sea of Galilee. And the herd drowns. Do you think that made the vocals heavy with Jesus? <laughs> but of course not. I mean, first of all, they lost everything they had. Second, the Bible is plain clear about it. It says they were afraid of what they saw. And so I just love the way they, the Bible puts it so mildly. It says, yeah. then they began to plead with Jesus yeah. to leave. The I mean, we all know what that meant, bragging translated. They wanted Jesus out of the picture. Get out. That's basically what the locals told Jesus in response. But probably the most fascinating difference between this side and the other side lies in the fact that when Jesus' side was well, somebody who finally recognized who Jesus was, the Messiah. Uh, the Son of God, God Himself and flesh. Jesus would always tell that person, please don't tell anyone who I am. My time hasn't come yet. Now Jesus goes over uh, to the other side and uh, faces such a fierce response on the back of the locals that Jesus, in fact, totally changes his strategy. Um, as Jesus was getting into the boat to go back to his side, that is, uh, the man who had been possessed with demons begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, No, go home to your people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell what Jesus had done for him. And all the people marveled, says the Bible. You see what just happened? Jesus goes over to the other side and meets such a hostile response on the part of the locals that Jesus delegates the responsibility for spreading the gospel over at the other side to a local man. Jesus tells uh, the local man, no, you're not coming with me back to my side. No, you go further to your side and tell your people what the Lord has done for you. Well, I mean, think of it. You might say, well, fine. This, the local knowledge thing does work with Jesus. Uh, well, it is how it works, actually. Jesus does go back to his side and uh, and this is a couple of uh, cities along, and then goes over to the other side once again. And a huge crowd of 5,000 men plus women plus children is there waiting for Jesus for three days. And Jesus feeds them with both the bread of life and 
the worst of life. Now you tell me, who told the locals that Jesus was coming again? Well, look no further. The local guide, after all, he was the only one who knew, and he was charged with that responsibility to spread the gospel over at the other side. And so the 5,000 men plus women plus children were a direct output of truth, partner of Jesus partnering with the local with regard to spreading the gospel over at the other side. And you may say, well, okay, it, it works with Jesus. Mind you, everything works with Jesus. But what does it have to do with us, the young men, uh, Bible study class? Well, it does, because frankly, not much has been changed, not in that regard anyway, uh, since the time of Jesus. They had the Jordan River parts on one side from the other side. Well, you have the Atlantic Ocean, Parting yellow from us in the Soviet Union. In fact, whatever country you go to, the country that sends missionaries out, uh, there is always a huge divide between them and us in the Soviet Union. But people know of Jesus' example, the one that uh, Jesus left with us in the Bible with regards to doing mission overseas, because think of it, in a sense, Jesus was. The first missionary overseas when he went over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Was he not? Yes, he was. And so churches follow Jesus' example and they send missionaries overseas. In fact, I know of a missionary overseas. He started in the uh, United States of America and went over to the other side, to the Soviet Union. And of all the people out there, he got in touch with this crazy guy. This is how I looked some 35 years ago. Scary. <laughs> My nickname with the KGB was the Tin Man. The Tin Man, remember that character from the Wizard of Oz story? The Tin Man. So why would you call anyone a Tin Man with KGB? Any ideas? Exactly right. I was heartless. Heartless I was. Um, well, it was the KGB which executed 200,000 ministers in Russia and demolished 40,000 churches over the span of 70 years of our communist captivity. So the question is, why, why did I even work for that nasty crowd? Any ideas? Money. Money. I mean, they pay you so much that for that much money you do anything. I was paid five times better than the national average. I mean, for you to get a glimpse of just how it felt, recall whatever you have. And I mean, your houses, your income, your cars, your yachts. Everything in my sponsor and multiply it by five and see how it feels. Be honest now. Does it feel good? Yes, it does. And that's how I felt. Uh, I felt I arrived. And if I had some moral remorses about what I did for the KGB, I could always come up with a good excuse for doing the wrongs. My best excuse, of course, being, well, I had to provide for my family. And it was my family which set me up on that big time. My daughter, she was nine years of age at the moment. Uh, she came back home from school and she uh, said that uh, she had made a new friend at school. And my daughter claimed that the father of the new friend was a Christian missionary from the United States of America. And I, I, and I looked straight into her eyes and I said, you better be kidding me. I mean, think of it. She said that he was a Christian. And I was, of course, a member of the Communist Party. I was an atheist. Therefore, I claimed there was no God. She said that, that he was a Christian missionary. 
and I was, of course, a KGB agent. So in my eyes, all these initiatives were spies, and I had to take care of those by profession. She said that he was a Christian missionary from the United States of America, and I was, of course, a proud product of the Soviet Union. So I thought we needed no help from the United States of America. Thank you very much. And so I got so disappointed with my own program that I did not believe her. Instead, I went to her school and I talked with her teacher. Only the teacher, the teacher confirmed that, that there was, in fact, a couple from the United States of America. And the teacher also said that the couple was looking for a Russian tutor, which almost devastated the Rama. Because as we say back in Russia, up in heavens, everybody is going to speak the Russian language because it takes eternity to learn it. <laughs> well, I mean, we look at it now. Believe me, I was not at the moment because that very moment I realized they were not tourists as I had hoped they were, but came to stay. And that, of course, made me even more concerned. Well, I was a KGB agent, so I came up with a plan to uh, investigate the case to then uh, report it to my uh, authorities for the KGB. I recall the fact that uh, Natasha, my wife, just happens to be a professional Russian as a second language instructor. She taught all the military officers who were coming to Russia from third world countries like uh, Guatemala, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua to get trained in military operations at the military academia in Moscow. Only to do so, they would have to go through a very rigorous course on the Russian language by immersion, a year long course too, so that then they could take classes at the military academia in Russia. So my wife did that for me, and I, of course, utilized that to my advantage. I made my wife teach the missionaries, and that gave me a chance to spy over the family. Now, I made it look completely innocent. I was a KGB agent of the country. So I would just go there to their place, and I would just sit there, uh, pretending I was there to wait until my wife would get through with her lesson, Whereas, in fact, I was there to listen uh, to what they were talking about. And frankly, all they talked about was God. They played it smart. They wanted my wife to use the Bible as their textbook. And all they wanted to learn was how to say the Lord's impression. And how to say, here comes Jesus Christ, the love of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In Russia, and how to say, and whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life in Russia. So, in about a half a year of just listening to that stuff, I got converted. Well, at least I gave God the chance to even exist in my head, that is. Which for me, a uh, KGB agent was a huge step away from my atheist crowd. But uh, the missionaries, uh, they were not just talkative about God, they were also very really pushy about God. Uh, Some half a year down the road, they uh, pushed me into that praying business and uh, reading the Bible business. They gave me a copy of the New Testament in Russian. And they made me read the Bible. Well, I didn't want to blow my cover, so I yielded. And since I only had the New Testament, I started with the Gospel of Matthew. And I read it through, and then um, the Gospel of Mark, too. And then I progressed to the Gospel of Luke. Only there, I stopped because um, I ran into a portion of the Gospel of Luke the portion depicting Jesus talking with his disciples. And among other things, Jesus tells some things. He says, if you in evil know how to give good gifts to your children, 
then how much more so will the Holy Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? And that was just dumbfounded the next day. Because that very moment I realized that Jesus knew me better than I thought he did. Because the first part of what Jesus was saying applied to me perfectly well. I mean, I knew I was an evil man. I was a teacher, teacher. But I also knew how to give good gifts to my children and time. Maybe fine. I was thinking, right, if the first part of what Jesus is saying applies to me this well, then what if the rest of what Jesus is saying applies to me as well? And basically, I put God to a test. I followed the guidelines of the scripture I just read, and I simply asked the Father of the Spirit. And then I looked up and I saw the Lord. And again, I saw the Lord just as clearly as I'm seeing you now. Mind you, I was not a disciple. I was a KGB agent, tough as a nail, hot headed, stiff necked. So this was not a mental image, this was the Lord. I guess nothing would work on me. So the Lord himself shows up, and I believe. The Lord was pulling down the Holy Spirit right inside of me. The Spirit felt like pure gold, only liquid. And I was filled up with the Holy Spirit of God all the way to the top. Now that was, of course, my conversion by heart, because in my heart, I knew Jesus was God. I saw him. Now, I go back home, and this is how I look. Uh, my wife meets me at the door, and she says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I said, what's wrong with me, honey? She says, you're smiling. You see, I have never smiled before. She made me because her father, a KGB current himself, never smiled either. So she honestly thought that it wasn't even proper for a man to ever smile. Now, apparently, Jesus made me smile that day without me realizing that. And of course, my smile gave me away. And since I was a baby in Christ, I didn't find anything more suitable than to tell my wife. But I became a Christian now. Now, she in turn confessed to me that she had become a Christian even earlier than I did. Only she was scared to death to talk about it with her husband, a KGB agent. And so then we were two complete babies in Christ. Frankly, we had no idea what to do as none whatsoever. So we decided we would read a little bit more of the Bible. Because after all, we thought it was the Bible which got us all started on that track, uh, which we did only to find out that those who were uh, accepting Jesus Christ in the Bible would then plant the church. Well, so be it. We said that uh, we planted the church in Moscow, Russia in 1991, and I was still a KGB agent undercover. I mean, imagine that church plan. But all I wanted to do was to turn the hammer and the sickle into the cross of the crown of Jesus. And then, of course, I had my self conversion. You see, I had three one by head, one by heart, and one by guts. Because one day I learned by my guts what the call of the Lord on my life was. And the call was to replenish the lost. To replenish the lost, which to me a KGB agent translated into the need to replenish 200,000 ministers that the KGB executed and planned 40,000 churches that the KGB demolished. Uh, I had no idea how to pursue that goal. I mean, it was just too big. Uh, and so all I knew though was that there was no way I could keep both my place and my job simultaneously. And so I decided I was quit one or the other. Well, I could not quit my faith because I saw Jesus Christ with my own eyes. But I could not quit KGB either because you don't quit the KGB just like that. In fact, in my days, there were two, uh, two only reasons on the basis of which you could quit the KGB. You could either go Google or drop dead, you know, dying mission. And frankly, 
None of the options I quite liked. So I decided I wait and I waited and I waited and I waited until an opportunity got presented itself. You might remember those days, you know, we can talk into Gorbachev, tear down this wall, uh, the glass was paid to wake up. Well, in those days, uh, Russia opened up for businesses and a lot of Americans rushed right in with this idea of the military enterprise. And the Russians just loved the idea. So the push for the free enterprise from within the Russian society was so huge that even the KGB had to respond to it. And they did by introducing yes, the third piece on allowing KGB agents to swap their jobs. Um, they didn't they do the free enterprise. Uh, only if you opted for that reason, you had to prove that the free enterprise that you claimed you would be doing would pay you better than the KGB. Which was, of course, a joke. I mean, nobody could beat the KGB on the money. It was rather a trick designed to prevent KGB agents from playing. Well, the most worked that out here. Um, there was a man who accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior at the Yeti Church that we planted, and he just happened to be the president of a corporation. So I shared my concern with him, and he, in return, wrote me a nice little letter on the letterhead of his company. I mean, he said it and everything. It looked official. Basically, the letter was saying that the company was offering me a job much better paid than the KGB. And of course, I knew just the number to quote. So with that letter, I went to the KGB, showed them the letter, asked if they could be here. Yeah. Well, they could. And so they let me go. And I never told them what I was actually doing. And I never worked for that corporation either. But for some good four years, they were covering me with that letter as if I worked for them. And then uh, when it became more or less safe, uh, they rather ruthlessly fired me and the church hired me. And then I planted the Moscow Center because I felt that through a seminary you could do it by the way of multiplication. I mean, I could have probably planted another church and maybe yet another church in my lifetime, but through a seminary I could train 300, 500, or 200,000 ministers online simultaneously. And it worked. I mean, right now I have uh, over 1,200 uh, student ministers at the Moscow Seminary. So I hope with your help, I can actually uh, fulfill the call of the Lord on my life, in my lifetime. It costs me $1,200 a year full ride to train a minister. Now, I mean, think of like this, like how much does it cost these days to send your kid to a college these days in the States? You're looking at what? 50,000? Probably you won't compare to that. It's 40 times better deal to train a minister in Russia than in the States. But the problem that I have with the idea of sending somebody to a seminary in the States today is that they don't come back. Try sending them to the States to stay. You will be happy if one comes back. So I invite you to participate in the gospel in Russia. To that end, please grab a brochure right there. Grab a magnet for your uh, refrigerator. And please read me your email. Um, I will hook you up with an actual student at the Moscow Center. Thank you for having me here at the church. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> questions? All right. No? I'm saying we're running short of time. Yeah. Could you talk to him after the okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know we, we ran over. Sasha, thank you so much for your testimony and for giving us the story. Right. Uh, next week's speaker is our own new cow, and his topic will be the prodigal son. Today in the pulpit, uh, our pastor, Jill Gunville, will have the topic of, I have let you see. And that will be in addition to recognizing our graduates. 